Good morning. Uh, welcome to this workshop, Trauma-Induced Trauma. Where we're examining the second victim, the immediate responder, and the lingering burden of disaster response. I'm Professor Donald Donahue. I am with the University of Maryland, Baltimore, the graduate school where I teach global health and healthcare administration. And I also have the honor and privilege of serving on the board of directors of the World Association for Disaster and Emergency Medicine, WADM. Start off with the requirements. I have no financial relationship and I do not benefit in any way uh, from this presentation or my particip participation in the expo. So, but we start off with the concept of perceptions. The map is not the territory is a famous statement by Alfred Korbisky, a Polish theorist. And what this means is that how we perceive things, how we, what we see, what we believe, does not necessarily match up with the reality, with what's out in the real world. And that has a huge impact on responders. Um, responders have very common attributes across all of our disciplines. They're very dedicated. There's a deep desire to help others. They have distinct technical competencies. They undergo extensive training to gain these skills. There's a very strong and pervasive professional culture that's both local, national, and international. There's a strong sense of team because of what, what we do is teamwork. And there's a very much an emphasis on strength and resiliency. And everybody, almost to a person, has extreme self-confidence and belief in the system. That's part of what draws us together and makes us successful. Yet, each responder is an ecosystem in his or her, her own self. We have different backgrounds, different environments, different training. So the things, the things we bring as a team vary by individuals. So therefore, e each of us is a complex adaptive system. We work and live within other complex, complex adaptive systems, both normally and responding, to, and especially during a disaster. And sometimes we exist in two worlds. A volunteer firefighter is a civilian most of the time, has a civilian job, but when the call of duty comes, they show up and they become a member of a team. Wicked problems abound. No one call, no one response is like any other response. They're complex, they're, they're complex, they're detailed, and the victims vary. Um, so what about you? I, have you ever been involved in a disaster or a mass casualty event? How did you feel afterwards? Did it influence how you took care of people at later? Are you willing to serve in a mass casualty event with all of the complexity? And do you think you or others have ever suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of what you do? So we look at the combination of the intersection of perception and reality. All, you know, we're all here because there's a strong will to do good. Uh, you know, there's something deep within inside all of us that we want to make the world better and help our fellow man. Uh, unfortunately, equally as strong as our own humanity, our fallibility and the, re the, the fact that you know, we, 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 we have capabilities that are limited. Um, in the accrediting healthcare accrediting organization in the United States, the Joint Commission did a study over 12 years ago of what what were the root causes of bad outcomes and set what they call sentinel events. And the two leading causes over a series of years were human factors and leadership. That, you know, so it's truly the human interaction that makes things go like we don't want them to go. So start off with by recognizing when you're going to a disaster, you're going to a, an accident or, or, or fire or, or a civil disturbance, uh, Sometimes the circumstances are just not designed in your favor. The situation is almost by definition going to be challenging. We as humans, we do really silly things sometimes. And some of them are literally just difficult to overcome. Now, look at medication safety. If you're in the field and there's somebody dying and you have to administer a medication in a hurry, we manufacture bottles and vials that look like each other uh, or names that sound alike. You know, these are, these are mistakes waiting to happen. So this brings us to the concept of the second victim. 
this term was originally coined to talk about what happens with physicians when a patient suffers injury or, or dies. And obviously the patient and the patient's family is the victim, the first victim with significant consequences. But research has shown that the, the medical team also suffers emotional damage and they share in some of the blame and they, they, they start to question themselves. So this is, this is applicable across the response community. When you know someone is ki- harmed or killed, and you felt that you could have, you could have been better, you could have prevented it. We all feel personally responsible. We become traumatized. We have that sickening realization when we realize I could have done this instead of that, and maybe that person would be alive today. Uh, these are life-altering events. These affect us for the rest of our lives, and you know we have a professional culture of where where we know how to respond to things. We know how to fix things. We know how to make things better. So when they don't get better, uh, there's a series of, there could be blame, but there's a series of shame too. People are, are remiss. They're hesitant to say, I didn't do my best or I did my best and it wasn't good enough. So the idea of the concept of a second victim is, is quite prevalent. In surveys, you know, across healthcare performers, for, employees, 60% have shared, you know, some, some sense of the second victim. Uh, you know, it, it just shows the statistics show that it's not uncommon. We do the best we can and the results aren't always what we hope for. And that impacts us. Uh, it creates an emotional side effect. We feel shame. Uh, we start to blame ourselves. We lose sleep. We start to question our own abilities. And these are these are prevalent, common and prevalent re- responses. So, looking at first at physicians, part of part of what can happen here is when you when you feel bad, when you feel shame, you burn out. You it it, it becomes a slow a slow degradation of your performance. So you start to make errors. You you question your judgment is a little different. Patients can sense this. They don't know it directly, but you're you're patients, the people you interact with become less satisfied. You turn over, people leave their jobs or they, they, you know, they call in sick more. Sometimes they get depressed. Uh, the research shows that motor vehicles increase among this. They do, people do poorly on standard tests and other, other routine, routine events. And then self-medication, they start to drink more or use substances. And the most effective group, the people that are impacted the most severely, are far more likely to commit suicide. So suicide among physicians, if physicians are the only professional group that the suicide rate is far higher than it is for non-physicians. And, and this is illustrative of, of everybody in this, in this session. But the additional barriers, you know, you don't, you worry about stigma, you worry about you know, time to get to care. Uh, you have the burden of saying of confidentiality. If you you worry if someone knows if someone knows that I'm you know that I'm depressed that I'm seeking psychological help, they may not want to work with me, or they may, I may lose my job, or I may not be hired. You know that carries forward to fire and EMS. Uh, we research has shown that. Three major components contribute to fire and EMS burnout. Exhaustion. I mean, just the work is demanding and it can be relentless. And, you know, it, sometimes you can't sleep or you make unhealthy choices. You eat poorly or you gamble or you become ir- irritable or you're erratic. You know, you, you lose your temper quickly. Uh, often burnout turn into themselves. People are burnt out. They, they disengage from family, from, from the work. You know, they become very quiet and into themselves. They also become cynical. They, you know, first responder, you become unsympathetic, angry towards the people you serve. And, you know, you, you degrade those who, who are victims or those who contribute to the situation that you respond to. Um, and, and again, similar to physicians, it's quite common. You know, it's estimated that a 20%, one in five firefighters and paramedics have suffered from PTSD. Uh, those, those, that 20% is six times more likely to attempt suicide. 
and years of service. One would think that experience experience is a prevention, but it's not. It, it, the longer you go, the more you run the risk of, of burnout. Uh, the physical demands, again, are, are significant. Heavy physical work in dangerous situations. Uh, and is the stress, if you're stressed, you're less likely to voice safety concerns. You don't necessarily use your prote personal protective equipment pr properly. I'll talk about that again in a few. Um, and you, know, you, you don't safely, you, you take unnecessary risks. Sometimes you're, you're subject to long hours and lack of sleep. Uh, insufficient sleep over a period of time can contribute to cardiovascular disease, obesity, hypertension, and changes in your emotion. Uh, half of all EMS personnel report poor sleep quality. And 70, astounding 70% have reported that they have at least some problems with sleep. And one in three firefighters has at least one significant sleep disorder. A significant challenge. There's also the added dimension of volunteer requirements. Many firefighters are volunteers. Not everybody belongs to a paid department. The volunteer experience, there's training, there's meetings, there's there's actual response. This is all this is all beyond your normal life, your day-to-day -day life. And often the, the the stresses you face when you when you're done with a call, you go back home and that institutional support, the camaraderie, the ability to decompress and discuss things doesn't exist because you've gone back to your civilian world. And you know, there's, there's overriding stigma. 92% of firefighters would not seek professional behavioral health because they think they'll be looked down upon. And similar, 86% of EMS have critical stress, yet 40% of that did not seek help. In law enforcement, there's similar dynamics. Uh, you know, there's the similar dynamics of stigma and everything, but there's the added uncertainty. Uh, that there's terrorist attacks. Uh, there's violence, increased violence with firearms and and you know knives and cleavers in urban areas. Uh, in you know, people have complained about low human resources and and you know not enough staff and not having the right equipment. Uh, there's some team issues, criticism from from civilians and society, and the lack of understanding. Some sometimes families just don't understand what law enforcement encounters and the reaction on them. And there are the unique dangers. Uh, increasing number globally, an increasing number of police officers are committing suicide. In France, uh, there there were the yellow vest issues and anger for job conditions in France. And you know, in one study alone, that one in four French law enforcement officers expressed very high distress levels, and more than half were at risk for developing a psychological disorder. And there's a you, there's an added problem is that by the nature of what they do, they have ready access to firearms. Often, police officers will commit suicide with their own service weapon. So you wind up having then we we have a, a system where organizational factors, individual factors, the environment we work in creates moral distress. And you know, it, it makes us believe that maybe the care we gave wasn't appropriate. Uh, we get tired of caring for other people, compassion fatigue. Uh, we have events, individual events or individual situations such as job turnover. All of these contribute to burnout. And, and that becomes a, a almost like a candle burning. It becomes a slow, consuming issue that eventually comes to culmination. So, what leads to this victimhood? Well, you know, often, often this competition for, to succeed it starts at a very young age. When we first go into school, we compete against each other. Uh, our cultures are failure is not an option. You know, we are trained. We are trained and we strive to save everybody to be able to be the, do the best we can. Um, you know, and when that happens, when that fails to happen, uh, you know, the systems we realize the systems not infallible. Uh, it has an impact on us. Um, you know, so we believe in the perfection of what we do, but when it doesn't come to fruition, it's hard to reconcile. Mistakes are unforgivable. You know, it, within our culture. The, if you let someone die, that's, you know, that's just 
it is very rare to say, well, you know, you did the best you can. That's and, and that's seen as a moral failure. We think that, you know, I'm highly trained, I'm highly skilled, and I should have been able to prevent that. And then there are uniquely troubling experiences, those those individual events that just shake us to our core. I mean, clearly seeing, you know, the Southeast, you know, whole neighborhoods burn uh, is, a, is a shock to both the residents and the responders down there. Or we have issues that just are beyond comprehension that, that attack the very identity of who we are, who we are as a nation, as a culture. And we unfortunately wind up seeing sometimes just random and severe events that shock even experienced responders. We witness unwarranted and widespread suffering. And it's seen as an attack on normalcy. It's, it's a degradation of, of the very world we live in. Uh, and, and these things are hard to overcome. So how do you know when somebody is suffering from a second victim? Well, they have to, they express distress, agony, uh, fear and guilt. Um, there's a whole, whole litany of emotions that they go through that can be very subtle concerns for your family excessive we should always have concern for our family and for the victims we serve but sometimes that concern becomes overwhelming we worry about or maybe pursue legal uh and we worry about our relationship and and our effectiveness with our friends and colleagues are we being supportive of them are they being supportive of us Uh, this is also prevalent in healthcare. Studies have shown that when healthcare providers are responding in a disaster, they are influenced by that same culture of perfection. They fear humiliation. They fear their peers looking down on them for doing something in, incorrect. They fear the public's perception and how, what people, you know, you could have done better. Uh, sometimes they worry about disciplinary action. There are cases, there have been cases where uh, clearly in the United States where when a health pro- health provider was put in a situa- an untenable situation with no options, later they were you know, charges were filed against them. In almost all cases that I'm aware of, those charges were eventually dropped. But that doesn't that doesn't mitigate the emotional and financial distress of being charged with a crime for something beyond beyond your capabilities. Uh, there's a tendency to hide errors and blame others if we can to divert errors. Um, and then, you know, when we need support, sometimes the support just isn't there uh, and we worry about legal ramifications. So in this case, in healthcare, healthcare following a disaster, we're less likely, we're less likely to report errors and, and truly do a, a, an accurate after action report to figure out what went wrong. Uh, we have long lasting memories. These things stick with us. Um, I re- in my own career, I remember things that happened 20 years ago. Uh, sad occasions where people died, multiple people died in an emergency department, one shift. And I remember it like it was yesterday. These things stay with you. So extraordinary events can prompt extraordinary responses. Uh, Here we look towards the Fort McMurray Horse River fires in in Canada, um, mostly because it was it was it was clearly documented and well studied. Fort McMurray is in northeastern Alberta. Um, and it's near, a, it's near a, a petroleum mining area. It has severe winter and generally mild summers. And as you see, approximately 80,000 residents and 4,000 people that work in the oil fields. Uh, in May of 2016, a fire began. Over the course of a little more than two months, fire consumed over 60,000 square kilometers, spread into the adjacent uh, province of Saskatchewan, uh, and you know, significantly, and an air quality index that measures between one and ten for toxicity. The air was up to thirty-eight. Um, it had a huge impact on on the communities, psychologically and physically. The human cost was tremendous. I mean, clearly on the residents, the people who were there, uh, you know, they they sought mental health. One in four people sought mental health within three months of the wildfire. Uh, significantly, though, and the point here is there was, you know, it was one of the first times where researchers were able to look at the responders, the firefighters, and there's no accurate way to estimate the physical impact on them. 
but the, they, you know, the estimate, conservative estimate, that they're suffering cost as many as almost three million dollars by what what they did, and the impact on them was significant. They, you know, one in five firefighters complained about respiratory problems, lingering coughing, wheezes, shortness of breath, shortness of breath, even days and weeks after they went home. Um, it was it was noticed that not everybody wore all the gear all the time. You're working in the in the heat uh, in a fire environment. It's easy to you know not wear your protective mask, your, your breathing mask, or not wear your helmet, or not wear your heavy coat. Um, one in six who was diagnosed with anxiety or depression. Uh, some some who live locally saw their own homes homes burn down. And there's a there's a tendency in re, in in response um, in the military as well, and uh, many many fields to not take a break, to keep on working beyond, keep on working beyond what's normal, beyond what can be uh, safe. And when that happens, you start making mistakes. You start uh, you start you know performing less than op- optimally. Uh, this is it has a significant impact on you and your response. And if your response becomes less efficient you will expose yourself to feeling as a second victim. So, you know, from the Fort McMurray fires, we learned that even a prepared community is usually unprepared for a large scale disaster. Health impacts happen immediately, but they also continue throughout the response and then thereafter. Every disaster is unique. It affects you differently physically, mentally, and spiritually. And, you know, the, they vary in scope time and the result the responses can vary in scope and timeliness and in placement where they're offered so in many ways you know the answers and from fort mcmurray the outcome is yet to be fully determined my canadian colleagues are doing research to figure out what could have been done better how could they have mitigated or prevented some of these impacts there's also uh, i'd like to introduce the need of the immediate or the spontaneous responders This is actually based on an individual colleague of mine, uh, an emergency department physician who was a volunteer at the first aid station at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. And when the when the bombing happened at the Boston Marathon, she fell into what she described as the disaster gap. Uh, There's a period of time from the moment of the incident until organized response comes that the people who are there, not only who witnessed the event, but are part of the event, are the primary and the initial responders. Uh, the, the interval is important there because it, responders, even though you're going into an, uh, even though you're responding and you're going into a situation that you largely do not know what's there, you know you're going into a situation. You come in prepared, you come in usually with equipment and with eight colleagues, and you're prepared to respond to whatever you find. The people who are at the at the event, who are become involved in the event, do not have that preparation time. They don't have that that framework. So they're immediately thrust into a into a traumatic event and they have to respond, often with no team or with no equipment, and just doing the best they can. And and, and their their efforts are their efforts are laudable. Uh, when I was developing this, there were all sorts of photographs of you know people people moving patients, people treating patients, putting on tourniquets. Uh, but what happened is afterwards, afterwards in the after action reports in the debriefing, uh, we looked at the responders, we looked at the victims. But at least in Boston, nobody talked to the people, the shop owners the EMTs, the physicians who were not only were at the event, but became part of the event yet were the initial responders. And that left them, that left them alone. Uh, the impact on this doctor is, uh, it was, was significant. Yeah. You know, that, you know, there's the reaction is alongside you react un, alongside people that are trained and people that are untrained. Um, it, you quickly realize that everything we learned is yet is not all there you know there's there's gaps in what we know and how we respond and then they weren't in, in, included in the debriefing so you know you, you get considered a bystander 
because you're either away from home, you're off duty, you don't belong to the local agency. So you become invisible in the aftermath and the analogy. And these folks are traumatized, but they're left to heal and recover by themselves. So in this physician's case, you know, she experienced instability, chaos, stress, overload, you know, sensory overload, uncertainty. Uh, she did the best she can. She trained, saved people, but she was haunted with self, self-doubts. Did I do enough? Did I make a difference? Did I do the right thing? A sense of survivor guilt. Uh, this left her devastated with self-doubt, and, and she was wondering, you know, she was wondering how she could have failed the people of Boston. Uh, in her case, she in her case she um, you know, she sought out. She went to the team that, being local, she went to the team that was conducting the debriefings, and she arranged to have debriefings for herself, for the shopkeepers, for the volunteers at the finish line, people that had been overlooked. Uh, I personally, I have the experience. Uh, I was stationed in the Pentagon and work was there on 9-11. And this, beyond this, the this shock and the stress of the events of that day, I remember the following day listening to the radio and I'm interviewing one of the police officers at the Pentagon. And this gentleman had saved easily a dozen people. Yet the biggest, his biggest statement was, I, I feel like I failed because I could have res- I, I should have been able to rescue more. Uh, you know, again, an example of that spontaneous responder on duty in the building when a, a significant event happens, performs heroically, yet feels that he failed. He failed the community. He swore to support and uphold. Uh, that's a pervasive and, and, and you know, sad reality. So institutionally, you know, as a system, it's our job to protect human capital. Uh, you know, we need to have responsive and resilient leadership that's in tune with the people we work with, uh, have systems and methods that build trust, transparency and consistency uh, in some areas, public private partnership, uh, gathering data, looking at what we do. Um, I know of a fire department, the fire brigade here in the United States, where the first officer on the scene is responsible. He commands the scene. The second officer on the scene becomes the recorder, the scribe, records everything that happens. And afterward, at every event, on every call, they're able to have a detailed explanation and analysis of what happened, what went right and what went wrong. And we build and we build and sustain these relationships. We look like this department I just spoke of. We embrace learning opportunities with 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 accurate uh, critical analysis, you know, it, not, not only celebrating our successes, but look at our near misses and our failures and then observe, listen and respond to the situation and the people around us. Um, one thing that was tried at, at, at Canada, Fort McMurray, was you know, psychosocial services at the disaster, curbside support, being right there. So we you know, right there where people are experiencing both the victims and the responders uh, frequent check-in sessions with staff, uh, outreach to with the people, not just the people downtown, but the people at the edge of town or the people remotely deployed, uh, and some of the support entities that we don't necessarily think of. You know, we focus on, when we're focusing on the mission, we don't always recognize that there are people supporting our mission. Uh, government staff support and worker support, you know, looking to the people the people that are peripheral to what we do, having town hall meetings, that's part of the information sharing, sharing people, you know, letting everybody know what's going on, being able to solicit input and feedback that what's bothering them, what's working well and what's not working well, ensuring breaks that the people who are deployed, making sure there's a rest schedule, making sure that there's a relief schedule, that they eat and they take care of themselves. And providing such assistance to other organizations as it's requested. Um, it's important to understand the feelings and reactions of the responders. For physicians, you know, using that as our base group again, almost two thirds said all I wanted was someone to talk to. Sixty uh, percent almost wanted just somebody to say it's okay, doctor. You did, you know, you, you still you do what you're doing. You do well. You're still talented. You're still competent. 
um, you know, validation of the decision making process and reassurance of self work. You know, what, when we start to doubt ourselves, that's an insidious slide into, into a self fulfilling prophecy. And this is replicated and been reinforced across all professions within all disciplines EMTs, firefighters, law enforcement, other volunteers all have these same feelings, all have these same reactions. So continuing to borrow from healthcare, the U.S. Agency for Health Research and Quality has a model that it calls CANDOR, communication and optimal resolution. When an adverse event happens, it gives us a methodology, a template for addressing that and identifying and then analyzing the unexpected harm, the physical, emotional, or financial impact that happens to a patient or a victim. Uh, it's a simple model, but we identify the event and then you implement the system. And there's a whole there's a whole manual that underscores this. And it, there's two different legs. One is your immediate response and disclosure. The response to the event to identify that it's an event, to address it directly and, and you know, that there's no shame. It's quality improvement. Uh, look for systemic fallacies. Look for contributing factors. Uh, then... In, then investigate and analyze it. You do a post, uh, you know, a morbidity and mortality review in medical terms. You know what could have gone wrong, what could have got, what went right. Uh, one is you know number three, the response is the immediate response. Number four is the follow up and the analysis. Both of these lead to resolution, and they they overlap, but they're also not necessarily the current events. And they're both events that must happen, but if, if you don't do either, if you don't do both, there'll be an impact on your response team, and there'll be an impact on the organization. You leave yourself vulnerable to it happening again. It's important to understand all the enca the encounter uh, that you know. There's always errors. There's always near misses. Some are preventable. Some are non-preventable. Um, you know, and and some. Some happen and and happen because we you know we weren't paying attention we were negligent you know, so it's important as you're as you're doing a critical analysis after action report to be able to determine what were things that could have been avoidable what were things that could be avoidable and or could not be avoidable and then how you know what were the contributing factors understand the second victim's concerns and symptoms. You know, their concerns are about the victim, about themselves, about their peers and their team, and what happens next. Uh, you know, many, many symptoms, fatigue, you can't sleep, uh, physical symptoms, muscle tension, rapid breathing, uh, frustration and job satisfaction, uh, you can't concentrate. You have flashbacks, uh, you know, combat veterans react to loud noises, uh, you know, people People react to the things that haunt us. You lose your confidence and you have grief and remorse. So understand, it's important to understand the process, the stages we go through. We, you know, we, we have this chaos and we respond to the accident. Then there's, you know, this thing that we start thinking about it. Uh, eventually we begin to find our footing again and restore our personal in integrity. Then in the after action act spec, when, well, afterwards, when we start reliving it, the, this chart calls it the inquisition. The questions are asked. Questions are asked about things you'd rather not talk about. Uh, then, you know, we come to the point where we, we can, should or could attain emotional first aid and, and we begin healing and then we move on and, you know, we move on in many, one of three ways. We either thrive and learn from it. Uh, we don't necessarily learn for it, but we keep on going or we burn out and we drop out. And, you know, and that's a loss of, that's a loss of talent. That's a loss of engagement. And that's really uh, a, a loss of, you you know, a human who contributes to the team. Uh, there are other ways, there are other, there are ways that you can react to this. Um, University of Virginia, the hospital system down there, has an entire well-being program, and one of them, one of the one of the fascinating facets of it is is written by this this gentleman who's a nurse in the emergency department. The pause, it was a journal article, and it, that's listed in the references at the end of this presentation. And th this came about this came about when I had a young lady brought into the emergency department 
that had been hit by a vehicle and she had massive, massive internal injuries. And the team, the medical team knew that she was not going to make it. Uh, so a young life lost, you know, university student, and that had a significant depressing effect on the team. And what they did at the time is they paused. They stopped for a minute. And, you know, many, probably many of us have seen you know, pictures of such events where they stopped for a minute to honor the victim, to honor, you know, honor her loss, but to also honor honor the efforts of the emergency the um, emergency medical team that brought her in and the receiving medical team in the emergency department that tried to save her and and you know just an emotional an emotional moment to recognize and honor the victim the responders and the effort and this in this one event this one action had a phenomenal healing effect on the team uh, also, it's important to understand, particularly in this age, uh, you know, in the midst of a, a virtual conference because of a pandemic, that there are sudden events and there are subtle and gradual crises. And COVID-19 gives us a, 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 a frightfully wonderful example of what happens. You know, we look at COVID-19 and it's a great, great risk of infection. And, you know, we look at medical staff, hospital staff, and this is a quote, that you know, though they they're afraid of being you know we wear PPE so when we're wearing PPE we can't eat we can't drink we don't go to the bathroom uh, many of our staff become dehydrated uh, you know they maintain they maintain close contact with other people uh, this has a this has a gradual debilitating effect on the staff it causes insomnia it's anxiety among the medical staff they fear for their family. Some of you know some of some have created alternate living arrangements, living in their basement or living in a hotel, versus potentially going home and infecting infecting their family. Uh, it's it's equally a crisis to a sudden event, an explosion or a crash or a terrorist event, but it it it, it manifests itself slowly and insidiously. Uh, and you know this is a, a a extract from a year old newspaper article where in the Maryland where I live in Maryland the Department of Health had a huge increase in calls to the helpline the crisis hotline the suicide hotline uh, and these numbers are phenomenal 842 percent increase over over the course of a year recognizing that this statistic was from a year ago before we had a year of isolation, before we had a year of repetitive lockdowns and the frustration that goes with this, uh, you know, it's it's there's clearly meant there's, there's clearly more stress, more mental stress, financial stress, and emotional stress going on right now. These have a debilitating impact on everybody. So, organizationally, we we need to create a culture of caring. The team we work with needs to understand and know and believe that the system cares about them. The system hears them. The system honors them. Uh, it's it's it, it's helpful to have a formalized peer support network. Uh, very you know, starting at the first tier, you know, just your local, your fellow workers, your your department chair, your you know, your your chief or your captain of the department, you know. Everybody, that, that first line of almost first aid, uh, a second tier is more, more formally trained. Uh, you peer support people maybe from the headquarters or, or you know, visiting emotional mental health workers, social workers, uh, you know, people who can bring a higher level of response, higher level of uh, assistance when necessary. And then having an expedited formal referral network. You know, chaplains and employee assistance programs, uh, you know, the formal formal systems that allow the vi allow the victim, the second victim, to access care in a dis in a ready but discreet manner. Uh, you know, often in, in designing systems like this, we've ensured that offices were put in in in, in innocuous places in places where. You know, there wasn't a big sign that said mental health provider on the front door. So the people seeking help could walk in quietly, uh, be seen discreetly and, and find themselves and return back to productive work. Uh, 
many, many challenges to peer support. There's a stigma. We, you know, we have we have cultures of strength. So reaching out for help is, is even among people who are highly trained in this realm, it, it's it's just not a, it's not accepted. Uh, you know, if it's if we're in a high acuity area, if something really significant happened, we have very little time to process that before we're on to our next call to be able to you know move things move things mentally through our head, you know, ahead. Uh, we fear the unknown. We like being in control. We like knowing what's going to go on. Uh, we don't want to compromise our collegial relationships. We don't want to fail our team. Re- repeated research has shown that teams fire EMS, police, military teams, work for each other. They work for a greater cause, but their dedication and their motivation is for their team, for each other. And then there's also people are hesitant hesitant to seek help because it may be an admission of some sort of legal culpability. Um, so provide superior port. You know, make sure that people are available to talk their experience. Uh, let them speak, but even more importantly, is hear, listen, hear what they're saying. Uh, walk them through the peer support interaction. Introduce them to the process. Let them look into the process, understand how it works, provide them with information, and then follow up. Uh, you know, after an event, you you go back, you go back to your base, and you discuss things, and you discuss things, and then you move on to the next event or preparation for the next mission. Uh, come back in a week, in a month, you know, re- review things. How are you doing? And be empathetic. You know, look, hear and listen and understand the, the psychic trauma. That's been un, that's been experienced by these people. Uh, be able to do an emotional group debriefing. Lean lean on the lean on the dynamics of the team. Let the team support each other. You know, guided by trained facilitators, and then bring other support, peer support if you can. Provide during the debriefing. You know, there to talk about talk about their experience. Uh, you know, I've seen cases where. I've seen cases where following following an event, a disaster, we brought someone in from a, a, a well-known disaster, the World Trade Center collapse, for example. And, you know, the individual came in. In this case, I'm thinking of the EMT division chief, the EMS division chief. And he was able to talk about his experience and how bad he felt and how he recovered. This gave strength to the people that we were training. And the people that had experienced similar events later, you know, after the events of 9-11, uh, there's a great, you know, 4T model, you know, disaster emergency management leaders can, you know, work to overcome the things, the things that keep us from learning and create a system and create an environment of learning, building the 4Ts or trust, truthful feedback, you know, oh, never, never not share the truth truth, hyper transparency to be able to, so people understand the plan, the design, the processes, and then building on that team-based resilience. The, t- the team is the strength of what we do. We can create, we, we exhibit, create and exhibit exactly leadership. You know, responders, we don't get to pick the calls they go on, but we as leaders can take steps to address these issues Assess your culture, honestly, brutally honestly. Uh, you know, how would you look upon a colleague if they sought professional help? Uh, do you feel comfortable seeking professional help? Uh, you know, how do you feel about mental health issues in general? And, you know, are you confident enough to stand up in front of your colleagues and state, this is important, this is, you know, this is things we need to do. Um, providing the option of help doesn't solve everything. Uh, so, you know, just don't put up a poster, announce that there's help, and then leave. Uh, you know, it's, it's got to be something that permeates the organization from the newest person to the most senior leadership, something that's believed and supported and promoted by example. And then look at your operations. Understand how, how what you do impacts the people that do it. Uh, you know, what are the demands on volunteers, uh, how, you know, family, uh, you know, are, how, how do people get together? How do people bond with each other? Uh, you know, what deci- what, how do your decisions impact not only the operation, but the individuals and their work lives? Uh, 
develop a wellness program, you know, promote wellness, not just weightlifting or, or, you know, simple exercise, but everything, take care of their physical health screenings, mental health, make sure that they, they maintain a healthy diet. Uh, they know how to manage their stress and do, how to do other preventive measures. In the University of Virginia system that I alluded to before, they promoted yoga uh, and other, other yoga and meditation as ways to ways to remediate stress outside of the job. And understand that burnout is a complicated issue and each organization needs to look at it through its own lens and assess the needs of their members and take action. And quoting the management guru, Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy. Understand that the culture of the organization is what will help its members survive and thrive. So, uh, many references for those who are interested uh, to continue to look. Uh, obviously, I'm a professor, so. And my contact information. Uh, I hope you found this instructive. And, you know, what we do. I, I firmly believe and I tell my students that people come into, people become responders because there's a, a sense in here that they want to help the world. Uh, if you ha can help, I believe if you can help one person in this world, you've earned your place on this earth. If you can help many people, you found something that's sacred. So I wish you well in your mission and your sacred mission, and I wish you health and success. Thank you very much. <laughs>